All right. Hey, good evening. This is How's Your Taproom Community with Jamar Valentine from Reda Brewing, Chris Strauss from Incendiary Brewing, and Bernardo Simmons, aka Tito from Dirtbag Ales. All right. So, all across the country, tap rooms in many shapes and sizes. Each interior and exterior is as unique as the individuals that produce and serve the beer within these tap rooms. Even more unique are the varied locations in which we have selected to open our tap rooms. As we have chosen an industry that continuously highlights its community, we often forget certain aspects of our community that are right in front of us. So what happens when we choose to focus on not only the value we gain from our craft beer community, but also the value we bring to the community directly surrounding our tap rooms. That's the question we have for you today. Uh, like I said, I'm Jamar Valentine. Uh, I am a Tar Heel born and bred, so I lived uh, in every compass direction of the state of North Carolina, growing up in the mountains, uh, going off to Chapel Hill, living on the beach for a few years, and being in Charlotte, North Carolina uh, for the last 12 years now. Um, I, while I studied political science in undergrad and pre-law concentration, uh, I actually fell into restaurants and bars and uh, managed within multi-unit operations for 15 plus years. Uh, was also heavily involved with the running community, which actually led me to the community uh, that Noto Brewing supports so strongly. And, you know, of course we have a run club, but we can talk about that later. Um, and that led to the relationship I have with the founders of Noto Brewing Company. And that's why I'm here today, but I'm not the only one that came from restaurants. Chris, what about you? So I'm Chris Strauss. I am the tapper manager at Incendiary Brewing here in Winston-Salem. And I grew up right down the road in Davidson County. And I was there from the age of six until, you know, now. And I started working in the restaurant industry when I was 16. And I pretty much did whatever position I needed to do that day. And then I skipped away to Auburn, Alabama for college, War Eagle, if any tigers are listening. And I started working at Mellow Mushroom there. I was at that one for four and a half years. Then when I moved back home, I started working at the Mellow Mushroom in Winston and I was at that one for five years. And I was bartending and managing there and I kind of got lucky and this job fell in my lap and I Moved right down the street to help open Incendiary Brewing in 2018, and I've been here ever since. So, Tito, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, so um, I actually am from Jacksonville, Florida. Um, that's where I was raised, and I joined the military back in 2005, which brought me to the lovely Sand Hills region of North Carolina by way of Fort Bragg. Um, I was an active duty medic for eight years, and... Uh, essentially decided to get out and start a brewing company. So the two are kind of, are very much intertwined in, into uh, who I've become today, or I guess evolved into, um, but it's, it's a great place to call him. So uh, Dirtbag Ales was uh, kind of a, I guess a, a dream come true. and <laughs> started home brewing back in 2010 I uh, got the name uh, from a coworker who misheard me having a conversation with somebody uh, about a 30 pound ale and asked what a dirt bag ale was. And I said, it's a great name for a company. And I started using it while I was home brewing in my garage. And um, we were brewing a lot of different beers and having a lot of uh, essentially block parties. And um, it was at one of those block parties that somebody was like, why don't you guys start a brewery? Um, and at the time, my partner, Eric, uh, who's still a nurse and works on Fort Bragg as well, would uh, come over and help brew in the mornings. And because um, we'd work at night and basically get off at 7 a.m. and brew all day. And then every couple months, we just have these huge parties. And um, it really led to this basically just us being able to see that there was a need for it here. Um, we opened up our first location, put our first uh, batches in September of 2014, 
at our old location, which is uh, on Legion Road, about three miles from where we're currently located. And then in uh, December of 2018, we started construction of our current location, which is uh, still here in Hope Mills, um, right off of uh, exit 41, I-95 in North Carolina. So if you guys are ever on the road and need a place to stop and wet your whistle, we're here. Um, we, we grew up and got ourselves six acres out here and it's a beautiful sprawling campus with a uh, craft cocktail bar, and, um, two restaurants, and soon a little cigar lounge. So uh, what about you, Chris? <laughs> So the owners, Brandon and John, started home brewing when they were in college. They actually went to high school together and they've been friends for you know, ever. And they produce a lot of really bad beer because there was not a lot of readily accessible information then. And they poured a lot of beer down the drain, which is very disheartening for, you know, a couple college students. So they fast forwarded a few years, they were working corporate America as adults and they found themselves back in the same neighborhood and picked up the old habit and were a lot more successful at it and actually had good beer. They started entering some home brewing competitions, won some awards and their family and friends were like, you know, you don't really like that corporate job. Why don't you pursue this dream you have? So they found this up and coming complex and decided to go for it. And they opened Incendiary in 2018. So Jamar, tell us about you guys. Yeah, so a uh, really unique story. Our founders were uh, home brewing in their garage, right? But uh, what's interesting is that they came from banking. They were, uh, one was an airline pilot and uh, the other worked in medical device sales. And, uh, you know, our founders, Todd and Susie Ford, completely cashed in their retirement to follow this passion. Um, and that was in 2010, uh, 2011, they actually opened uh, our first location in the Noda neighborhood. And, uh, you know, as things started growing, uh, 2014, uh, we got our very first World Beer Cup gold medal uh, for the American IPA. Uh, in 2015 was when we knew we needed a bigger boat. So we found a location less than a mile away, uh, an old vinegar factory uh, that's actually a historic landmark here in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina. And uh, this old vinegar factory we realized was gonna be big enough to support our growth for long-term. So here we are now, um, but that's the history of the brewery in short. Um, more importantly, what about your town, uh, Chris? So you can't talk about Winston-Salem and not mention tobacco because this town was quite literally built in the back of the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. This company was extremely important to Winston because they provided a ton of jobs to residents of Winston, including a lot of minorities and people with disabilities, but they also provided a lot of income for the rural farmers surrounding the city. And so this company was extremely important for jobs, residents, the thriving economy. Uh, but as you can see behind me, this is actually where our brewery is. It is the old Bailey power plant. And the trains actually came in on those trestles behind me and dumped coal into the coal pit, which is where I'm currently sitting. We do all of our events and then conveyed into the building and burned for power. And that's where the name incendiary actually comes from. So this building was kind of the central hub for all the factories in downtown Winston. And there was a lot of surrounding warehouses, packaging plants, processing and all that. So this company was extremely important to Winston and still is today. But fast forward a few years and all these buildings no longer serve their original purpose and they became pretty abandoned. And so you had all these empty shells of history long ago. About 15 years ago, there was a big revitalization of downtown Winston-Salem and downtown became cleaner and newer and businesses started coming in and people followed because there was actually something to do 
in downtown and there wasn't previously. So this town is definitely growing and all those old factories are now luxury apartments. And we have a lot of new apartments actually being built because so many people are moving to this area. And it's still a very diverse town. And you have, you know, a lot of college students. We have six different colleges here between public and private. So you have people moving from out of state and you have just all of our melting pot as it is, plus a lot of rural areas that people actually come into Winston because there's nothing to do out in the sticks. And so it's just a very diverse community and you know it's it's definitely growing because it's safe but it's really affordable to live here and we have a lot of you know fine beer fine arts and fine food that are coming about so uh Tito, tell us a little bit about you yeah so um fort bragg is the, one of the biggest uh, proponents here in the, this area of north carolina but um historically Fayetteville and uh, the Sand Hills region or this portion of the Sand Hills region has actually been um, pretty monumental in, in uh, years past. Um, originally, the um, U.S. Constitution was actually ratified for the state here in Fayetteville. Um, and then that it was along like Sherman's March. There were revolutionaries that were here as well that helped uh, to kind of put us on our path to independence from the uh, from the uh, monarchs in past days. But um, Camp Bragg, which is now Fort Bragg, actually came about um, back in 1918. And back then it was just a uh, artillery uh, range. Um, but the population basically for that, that installation started to uh, double after World War II and then, or after World War One, going into World War II. Um, and since then it's actually grown to become the uh, hub for the military. Um, we've got a lot of major, like higher ranking officials that actually call Fort Bragg home. I think their headquarters are here. Um, and so essentially at, at any point, like any major decision militarily is being made with uh, with the heads that are, you know, 20 minutes from here. Um, it's it's an awesome feeling. It's, it's awesome to see um, all the walks of life that people actually bring to the area because you're you're talking about um you know one percent of the u.s population that decides to serve their country and they come here from different places uh some from tiny towns in the midwest and some from big cities out in california and new york so it brings a lot of perspective to the table and it also brings a lot of ideas and on, um, a lot of folks that are looking for ways to engage in their local community that you know they haven't they don't necessarily see it around here um, but, uh, Fort Bragg being as, as, uh, profound as it is and having the major commands here actually does, um, there's a caveat to that in that we have a uh, standing like GRF mission or global response mission. So at any time you can up to 10% of the troops can be deployed anywhere war worldwide to respond to anything from uh, hurricane relief to uh, any attacks on our country. So it's kind of just a unique perspective to put on um, when you're thinking about your customers and, and your, your community and how you can actually get back. What about you, Jamar? How's, uh, how's life over in Charlotte? Yeah, you know, uh, Tito, you and Chris both hit on a couple of uh, great ideas there. The fact that uh, you know, Chris can see Winston as a melting pot and you see that very global, diverse perspective in uh, Fayetteville. Uh, and we are also blessed here in Charlotte. Uh, uh, currently, it's the largest city, at least by population, in the, in the state of North Carolina. Uh, it's certainly a banking city with, uh, you know, East Coast headquarters for uh, a few of the major banks in the country. Uh, there's multiple colleges and universities here. So the higher education brings a lot of people from faculty to staff and students. Um, there's uh, pro sports teams here, ironically, uh, an NFL team called the Carolina Panthers, uh, hoops team called the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, there's uh, semi, there's a, 
major league soccer team coming, Charlotte FC, will be here next year. There's hockey, there's baseball, and you know there's also uh, two really great hospital systems here um, that employ tons of people uh, with other health care. And so we are very, uh, very, very grateful for uh, all that this contributes to our community. Um, and as Charlotte continues to grow, ironically, the neighborhood that we decided to place our tap room, uh, it was in Noda, the Historic Arts District, uh, the North Davidson Historic Arts District here in Charlotte. Uh, and at one point, this was a mill district with uh, mill jobs uh, that were very prevalent uh, from the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And as the mill work started to change and shift uh, and those jobs started to dry up, the people that were pushed to reside over here were not just the mill workers, but also individuals of low socioeconomic income uh, and also uh, various minorities, uh, certainly uh, at one point LGBTQ uh, plus communities were pushed here. But even before that, due to redlining and other uh, federal and local initiatives throughout the 1900s, uh, certainly you know, uh, various people of color and uh, other ethnic and racial backgrounds were pushed out here. So, of course, uh, like we see all over the country, uh, in neighborhoods where this occurs, uh, it leads to arts and music uh, starting to thrive. Uh, and now we find that there are lots of uh, thriving arts and music venues here. There's bars, there's breweries, uh, globally eclectic and chef driven dining. There's public transportation that comes straight in via the light rail, and uh, there's a great retail presence. So all of that is, you know, a great reason for us to be here now. Uh, but it's not just where we are, uh, but also what are we offering for the community? Uh, Chris. So we definitely picked a part of downtown that was not developed yet. That revitalization I was talking about didn't make its way down here. Uh, this area was definitely kind of on the wrong side of the tracks previously. You didn't come down here after dark unless you had a purpose. Now there's a lot of people that come down here because there's so many things to do. So we were really glad to jump in early on that project before you know it was built up and Kind of got our foot in the door to help bring more people down here because breweries have a big draw and we wanted to start doing a lot of events for our community to bring them down this way and now we have all these businesses that are opening next to us that we all get to collaborate together but not only are we trying to do whatever we can to bring people to this new area called innovation quarter but we're also doing a lot of like free events and you know, we don't just have live music. We have full-blown concerts with a big stage and lights and sound. And we have such a wide variety of music. We try to have a little bit of something for everybody. And, you know, it's all free. Like everything we do is just about getting people down here, bringing people together to celebrate life and have a good time with a tasty beer. We do markets. We bring all these local vendors down here, have them set up tents. That way people can come and shop and spend money and help everybody, local artists that hand make everything. We're getting ready to have our third annual Halloween one coming up in a couple weeks, costume contest. And, you know, we have an Oktoberfest every year. And, and you know, all of our events, they're, they're not about making money. They're about bringing everyone together. We try to have a little bit of something for everyone so they can come and feel included and feel safe and have a good time. and. You know, it's just, it's really what our main goal is, is to bring people together. And, you know, we hope they like their beer too. <laughs> so, Tina, tell us about you. Uh, yeah, for us, we, um, we were the only ones who decided to focus on just making beer in our area. Um, initially, when we started out, there were two other um, breweries that were attached to restaurants. Uh, 
not that they didn't care about their beer, but they didn't do any anything with distribution whatsoever. So um, we opened with the with the mindset that everybody wants to drink good beer, and they all are longing for that community aspect, that local watering hole, and um, we wanted to bring that. Um, initially, there was like literally like one food truck that we had out pretty much every weekend, <laughs> um, and then we both kind of got sick of each other for a little bit there, but. We all made it through, and um, what we did is we just we provided um, what I feel is excellent cu- customer service for our our, um, our patrons. You know, um, it, the, the craft beer scene at the time could be a little daunting when you walk in and you don't know the difference between a, a Kolsch and a Keller beer or uh, a pale ale and an IPA. And for some people, like being in that social setting, like it's not something that they're they're comfortable with or want to expose themselves to. So um, for us, it was literally just being able to teach people those little um, nuances and the differences between the beer styles and then give, offering them something that they don't necessarily, um, you know, wasn't even on their radar that they might like this style of beer, but they give it a whirl and, oh, it turns out I, I like that, that, that style of beer. And it was good and they enjoyed it. Um, but with the customer service aspect in mind, uh, we also wanted to provide a, a safe family oriented uh, space with entertainment that, that really just crosses across um, all demographics and, and, and all age groups. So um, I think we kind of uh, hit the nail on the head with, with, you know, giving people that and being able to be that inclusive space where uh, it doesn't matter what walk of life you come from, you can come here and uh, enjoy your yourself and then know that it's a it's a good safe safe place to be and uh what about the the trendsetters out there in charlotte jamar (laughs) yeah (laughs) ironically (laughs) uh, when we first opened there there was another brewery in town but uh we were the only other brewery and we set up on the opposite end of town the neighborhood i described you know certainly or was certainly a very different culture from what you saw on the other side. And so uh, the people in the city you know, had the opportunity to have a little more accessible craft beer to them. And in the midst of having more accessible craft beer, uh, we committed from the very beginning to producing a lot of different beers that were true to uh, the uh, BJC styles. Um, many different styles continually that a lot of people, particularly in this state, uh, had not really had the chance to dive into in the sense of craft beer from North Carolina. Um, And we were excited to to do so. We continued to do this and we started releasing beers that we called notables every single week, uh, a different beer. And the wide variety just helped continue to drive the education uh, for beer here. as the you know the notables came and the side of town that we were on uh, evolved it also uh, led to more people being aware of the life and the culture that was right here in charlotte uh, in this part of town and previously uh, you know many people wouldn't have come to this side i think that is something similar to what chris expressed with her her part of town innovation quarter and now, like I said, Noda is thriving. We'd like to think that we played a little part in it at the very least. You know, we may not have, uh, we weren't the only contributor, but you know, when one brewery winds up in a place, it leads to the, the pathway for so many other great businesses to start to open and evolve. Uh, that's what we've done so far, but uh, you know, what else are we uniquely offering now that tap rooms are opening in more and more places. Tito? Um, well, I mean, not to, you know, beat a dead horse, the, the customer service aspect is is really big for us. Um, we are not on the um, path, you know, we're not downtown or in any like walking sort of area. So for us, uh, when folks come out, it's for, hopefully for them to spend a lot of time with us. Um, so we do our best to, to um, include, you know, again, activities for the family. We've got a, we, um, we have a kid park 
dog park, um, and then a full calendar of multicultural events uh, throughout the year, um, which for me is a really big thing uh, being uh, biracial myself. I'm, my, my mother is Puerto Rican, my dad's black. So uh, in the past year, um, we've been able to both host a Juneteenth celebration and a Puerto Rican uh, chinchorreo. And that's, it's all <laughs> inspiring when you, you look back at like how many people actually come through and um, you see everybody come together, uh, specifically the Puerto Rican festival. We had visitors from as far north as New York and as far south as Florida come in and some of them were comparing it to the Puerto Rican festival that happens in the Bronx every year. So like being able to be part of that and um, bring people in and not only give them a craft beer experience, but also be like the first time that a lot of these folks have actually even seen like how beer is made um, and giving them that, that knowledge, that background knowledge so that they can actually go back home to, you know, Florida, or New York, and then they're going to do the exact same thing and be like, Oh, I can go check out this brewery over here and maybe get a little bit of that same, that same feeling or that same reception that I got when I was in North Carolina that one time. Um, our customers here will uh, often tell us that they don't feel like they're in Fayetteville when they come out here, which um, not going to lie, the, this area has not gotten the best rep in North Carolina. Um, it's been called Vietnam, but we are, we're working to, to show people that it's, it's better than that. It's about the people that are here and, um, it really is a community that that really brings uh, a lot of America to one space, uh, if you will. Let's see. Uh, what about you guys out there in uh, Winston, Chris? So our space is very unique in that there's really no other space like this in downtown Winston Salem. Like that is the unique thing about it, and. You can kind of tell behind me like how big of a space it is and which why that's why we we're able to have the events that we're able to and you know it's it's got room for the entire family like i don't know if you can tell but there's scooters behind me there's a football game going on behind me a lot of times there's soccer out here too dogs are welcome and so it's just it's just such a big space that has so much going on around it and we specifically picked a complex area that had a lot of different businesses. There's office space above us. There's apartments across the street. There's a med school across the street. You know, we have pizza right next door and tacos upstairs. And, you know, like what doesn't go better with that than beer? And then there's chocolate and ice cream around the corner for the kids. And there's a gym that we partner with a lot of times. And you're doing a, a detox, retox sort of thing, like get your beer after you burn all those calories. So, I mean, it's just such a, uh, its own little economy down here. It's like, we're not a one-stop shop. You're not just coming to get a beer. You're getting a whole experience. You're getting dinner with the family. You're getting fun events. You're, you get to bring the family pet with you and you get to go across the street and watch a movie in the park or ride your bike down Long Branch Trail. And so like, that's just the unique thing is you can park in one spot and you have a whole day's worth of activities you know, get your hair cut and come have a glass of wine in the cool pit afterwards. Like, it's just, there's so much to do down here. And it's really why we picked this place is even though a lot of those businesses weren't open, when we opened, we knew they were coming. And, you know, that was definitely on purpose because again, we wanted to bring people together. So we wanted to go somewhere that had a lot of different things to offer. Um, and, you know, we, we have amazing neighbors that we get to partner with all the time. We do events with the apartments. We do events with the med school. We do movie nights in the park. We, we do everything. And, and that's just the great thing of you're not driving 20 minutes to get a beer and then turn around and drive 20 minutes back. You're stepping out to have some fresh air and exercise and then hanging out with the family and spending time together and meeting some friends while you're down here. So that's just the really unique thing about where we are and there's so much to do. So I'll say that with the three of us on this, this panel, all three of us happen to have sizable outdoor spaces. And I know that that is really a blessing 
uh, in, in beer and tap room selections. Uh, a lot of people in a lot of different towns and cities uh, cannot find that kind of real estate to, to be able to work with outside. Uh, but what you see with what Chris has done at Incendiary, you know, her company found a spot where they didn't have to pay for the extra real estate outside as it's shared by the other businesses with which they have. Um, and, you know, Tito very much has a large, 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 large outdoor space. Even if it was uh, just a dirt patch before, it is certainly full of life now. Um, and here at Noda, uh, we don't take for granted. We do have a nice outdoor space, a very nice outdoor space. And while we have the outdoor space, we also have private rooms available and a number of other reservable uh, spaces, including a covered pavilion outside, so that any number of people can have private events, whether that be a local nonprofit or a small business or even a family, uh, people that would love to host events that may not be able to afford the minimums that are charged at restaurants and bars or even other breweries all around. And by not charging a fee to individuals to book our reservable spaces, uh, people can have more access to opportunities to celebrate with friends, with family, to conduct meetings, to, to move their business forward, or even to help draw attention to their nonprofit. Uh, additionally, you know, like so many other breweries around, uh, we find ways to contribute routinely to others. And so for us, it's not just brewing beer and saying, you know, we'll donate for this beer. Uh, routinely, every single week, we also host events that we call You Drink, We Donates, where we allow nonprofit organizations to come out and set up a table and tell people all about what they, you know, what they do and bring awareness. In addition to the bringing awareness, we're also already going to contribute um, for every single beer that's sold that night, every single pint that's sold that night, I should say. Um, and then we also, as of this year, have secured a pretty solid offsite events team uh, where we can come out and support various events for nonprofit organizations, or for uh, business and institutions that are looking to, to just grow and to develop uh, right now. And it feels great to do it. Um, and we wouldn't be able to if we weren't blessed with having the staff that we have, the team that we have, and the resources. So what's the point in having all of this if we can't give back to our community around us? So with that said, you know we're all doing great things now, but what more can we continue to do? Uh, Chris? So we definitely want to keep bringing the fun for everybody. Um, you know, whether that's more concerts or just a whole nother set of events that we haven't even tapped into yet. But we definitely want to keep bringing people together and just and do more in that aspect. But definitely as we grow, we want to have a bigger fundraising impacts. We do as much as we can now. We host fundraisers and right now we focus primarily on helping the organizations that focus on children and focus on animals. So there are two soft spots. We love kids and dogs and you know we just hope to increase the number of fundraising, increase the dollar amounts that we can throw at our local community organizations and and you know maybe even branch out into other opportunities to help our community that we haven't even tapped into yet and then you know, like as we grow we want to help our community grow and those that are in need what about you guys so you know uh we are all doing something good now but uh you know we are really looking for more opportunities to help continue to uh, support other local businesses. Um, you know, we've got uh, this one idea right now that there are a number of small businesses that are just in their kickstarting phases. Uh, maybe they are simply a cart uh, or they are a pop-up vendor that sets up at markets and 
they could really use a place to start with more uh, similar to a brick and mortar. And we realized that we have a tap room that isn't being used most days uh, throughout the week, Monday through Friday during the day. And we realized it could be an opportunity for other individuals uh, to set up space and use. And we would love to be able to provide that opportunity for them. Um, certainly in 2020, uh, a lot more awareness was shed all around the BA and the craft beer community. And we realized that it wasn't just justice that was often skewed in the brewing community. But we realized that uh, some equity was missing, and I don't just mean for uh, racial minorities. Um, so we want to amplify more voices of minority communities. And when I say it's not just racial minorities, uh, I think it was the fall virtual conference for craft beer professionals this time last year that Kelly Weiss uh, from Perkman Brewing referred to the uh, parability or disabled or ADA community as being such a large uh, afterthought of a minority group. And, you know, certainly the ADA community spans across all races, religions, gender, sexual orientations, uh, ethnic and national backgrounds, uh, religious. Uh, so we certainly uh, want to find more ways to encourage and support like you know are there enough ada accessible tables um you know uh what about the hearing impaired the visual impaired what more steps can we continue to take uh how much does it cost to get uh, automatic uh, wheelchair accessible door open open or installed you know these simple things can make a huge difference for many different individuals and we're just looking to expand so uh we are really just looking to help support more of these minority communities along with small businesses. Uh, in 2020, we started bringing in more food trucks that uh, are also from various global uh, perspectives and backgrounds because it takes more than just a hip hop night to bring in more diverse groups. Uh, and that's what we're working on, but uh, sir. Yeah, so um, for us, I think uh, we just want to continue to bring um, unique experiences to our customers here, um, focusing on obviously more diverse uh, faces and um, experiences for people, um, whether that's through art, um, through music, any any way that we can. Uh, we're, we're always looking at different creative ways to hold events and, and really bring the community out. Um, we are also hoping to grow our farmers market and include a lot more of uh, North Carolina's farmers, especially in the rural rural areas. Um, we have done our best to reach out to farmers here in our area, and uh, as it stands, we only have uh, about let's say about ten producers who are growing not only livestock but also growing produce and bringing it out um, every Sunday uh, to sale. Um, my hope is that in the future we can kind of get some of those outliers that are um, out in the Raleigh, Winston-Salem area and a lot more rural northern areas that don't necessarily have the uh, means to get out and, and sell their, their goods because uh, we definitely have the, the market for it down here and the producers that we do have are um, they're keeping up but they, they, they can bring more and we can do more for, for not just here but North Carolina as a whole. So. Uh, hopefully, in the future, you guys will be seeing a lot more, uh, come, a lot more good things coming from this area. Love it. So, uh, you know, we've all we're all in tap rooms that have been open for uh, a couple years at least. Uh, but hopefully, this has provided some insight for ideas for you for what you can do if you're looking to open your first tap room or even if you're looking to expand and open an additional tap room. Uh, in the end, you can see in all these cases, um, we found ways to connect and support our community. And in turn, our community has connected and supported us. Um, you know, it, the, when the 
purpose and the cause is not just increasing your bottom line, you find that your bottom line will continue to increase and thrive regardless. Uh, Chris, Tito, any closing thoughts? You know, just keep working on bringing your community together and, and have something for everybody. Don't just stick to one type of event or one type of music, uh, one type of vendor that you always have out. Like, you know, you got to change it up. And and if somebody's not interested in what you're doing this weekend, well, be like, hey, I got this completely other event coming up two weeks from now. You'd probably like that one. You know, we try to keep everything as different and diverse as our beer selection, you know, because you got to have something for everybody. Um, I would challenge you to look around your tap room and really look in and see what you don't look at. Who's not at the table? Who's not in your tap room space? Mm -hmm. And how is it that you can reach out? What is it that you can do? Is it, I mean, we are all doing this human experience thing together. You got to be able to you know, cross yeah. the line and get them out. That's great. And so, uh, if you're reading or if you're watching right now, uh, streaming live, or watching the video later, you can see all of our emails right there. Uh, you, if you're listening, I think you'll be able to catch it on Spotify as well. Uh, but Chris, Tito, uh, how can the people find you on social media as well? So I can be reached at Chris at incendiarybrewing.com. Our website is incendiarybrewing.com. Instagram is just incendiarybrew. And we you know, keep it pretty up to date, post fairly often. And same thing for the Facebook, Incendiary Brewing Co. And you know, we get a ton of messages through there, so don't hesitate to reach out through any of those means. So I'm uh, Jamar at NoterBrewing.com. Uh, that's Jamar with two A's. And you can find Noter Brewing everywhere at Noter Brewing. i got to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Uh, you can find us at Dirtbag Ales um, on Instagram and then Dirtbag Ales Brewery and Taproom on uh, Facebook. Great. All right. Nice. Oh, reach out if you have any questions. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thanks, guys. Thank you.